Last week we read it. Chapter 2, verse 18, we discussed the concept of the verse that says it is not good for man to be alone. And we offered the various uh, interpretations of what, what, what that verse could mean. Um, practical to the Kabbalistic, that was fun. Um, verse 19 continues and this sort of takes a different, a different, a different track and starts to talk about Adam's relationship with the animals. Um, again, just like we had, a, we're going to have a repetition of how Adam and Eve are created, because in chapter one it just said they were created male and female, and in chapter two here we're going to discuss more, discuss it more in detail, as we will see in the next few verses, verse twenty-one and on. So here we also have a reiteration of the creation of the animals. And if you read verse 19, you see Hashem Elohim formed from the ground every beast of the field and every bird of the heaven and brought them to man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called the living creature, that is its name. So it's very important to understand that uh, in the book of Genesis, Adam, even before going to the Garden of Eden, the first thing Adam does is Adam creates a dictionary. He has to name the creations. And the question, of course, is what is the significance of that? What is the difference? What you call the animal, if the animal is called a donkey or an elephant, why does this really matter to the story to the, to the extent that it's placed in the Torah? And God brings the animals to Adam to see what Adam will call the animal. Like, why is this a big thing? We don't read this about, it doesn't say it's about the other creations. So we'll get to that in a moment, but just but just talking about the first, the first, the first word of the port of the verse. Naidit ser Hashem Elokim. Hashem Elokim formed from the ground. That's the typical interpretation is to form from the word Yitzira, to formation. There is some modern interpretations that want to say that the verse, this word, this word Vayitzer does not mean um, form. It means something else. It comes from the word that we read in yesterday's parsha. And yesterday's parasha, we read the laws of war. So the verse says, ki tatsur. Ki tatsur, if you will see, besiege a city. And the laws over there is you can't uh, destroy the trees and you have to allow, allow a place for people to escape, etc. But the opening statement of that portion, I believe it's the seventh portion of yesterday's reading, is reading a, a portion of Shoftim is ki tatsur, if you will siege. So the word tatsur, to, to lay siege, has a, has a meaning which also means to rule. So if you're lay, laying siege on a city, it means you're overpowering the city. You have a certain position of rulership over the city. So those commentators say that here we're not really talking about the animals per se, the formation of the animals per se. That was already spoken about in chapter one. Here we're talking about the fact that Adam rules over the animals and the, the, his rulership is expressed amongst other things that Adam determines the name of the animal. So we have to think about what does a name mean and why that is so, and why, and why that is so significant. So the first, the first thing to think about a name is in, is in modern Hebrew, the word name is really a I guess, I guess it's also in other languages, it's a, sort of a classification. So the word shame comes from the word sham, there. In other words, when you're naming something, you're placing it, you're defining its function in the world. And when Adam names the animals, really what he's doing is he's expressing their um, nature and their definition. So in other words, he's saying this animal has this character and therefore I'm gonna name it in this way, okay. So why is that so important to know? So there are various ways of interpret interpretation. One interpretation is that the key is the end of the verse. The end of the verse reads, whatever the man called each living creature, that is its name. Now that's a repetition, you don't need that, right? First the verse says, God brought, um, God formed all the animals and brought them to man to see what he would call them. 
Okay, so God wants to know what Adam would call them. And then it says, whatever the man called each living creature, that is its name. Why do I need the end? Just say, God asked Adam. Uh, you, you can actually say what it says in the next verse. The next verse says, the man gave names to every animal. Just say, man gave names to every animal. That's what it says in, verse, in the next verse. Here it says, whatever man calls the animal, that is its name. What is that telling us? So one approach is as follows. A name, like we said, is a character. If I could name, if I could name something, I mean, I'm defining its characteristics. So Adam looks at an animal, and Adam, Adam says, this is the characteristics of this animal. And then the Torah concludes and says, whatever Adam observed about the characteristic of the animal, that's in fact the name. That's the way the animal is because animals don't change. Contrast that to the human being. The human being was not named yet. When he will be named, the name constantly changes, right? Even the way Adam refers to Eve changes, even the way Adam himself's name changes from Adam to Ish, there are other names. And certainly we read about Abraham and Jacob, name is changing. What is a name changing? Because as a person develops, so you can't define a person. What is the characteristics of a person? Well, a person is raw material. If the person decides to change and expand and develop, so the name will have to change as well. So what the verse is saying is that Adam's relationship with the animal, whatever Adam names an animal, in other words, Adam observes the, the world around him and he sees certain characteristics and he names those characteristics. Says the Torah, those characteristics stay the same because that's what an animal is. And the contrast is that is with the person. The person, however, can't really name a person. I mean, you can name them, but the Torah is not gonna say that the person's name will stay the same because a person's name, meaning a person's definition, how do you classify a person? How do you define his characteristics? That is up for uh, change. So that's an idea that we said earlier in other, in other verses, but the commentaries are finding sort of consistent, consistent um, themes reappearing in these verses, because otherwise, what is, this, what is it so important to know that Adam named the animals, and then the Torah has to say, whatever Adam named, that's, what, that's the name that stays. Why is that important? So that's one approach. Then we go to the mystical approach. The mystical approach, the Kabbalistic um, approach is as follows. The, according to the Kabbalah, oh, so the Kabbalah quotes a Medrash. The Kabbalah quotes a Medrash. The Medrash says that um, the angels turn to God and say, what is the characteristic of this human being? What's so great about the human being? You created a new human being. Why, why are you so you created a new human being? Why are you so excited about the human being? What does it have that we don't have? So God tells the angels, well, his wisdom is greater than yours. His wisdom is greater than yours. Okay. How do you know that, that, that the human wisdom is greater than, than the wisdom of the angels? Says God, to prove that, he says, look, can you name the animals? And they say, no, we can't name the animals. So God says, well, Adam can name the animals. So Adam names the animals, and that's a vindication of God's claim to the angels that indeed the um, the, the, the wisdom of Adam is superior to their own wisdom. Okay, that's a nice medrash, but the medrash raises more questions than answers. Why can't the angels name animals? What's the big deal? You just make up a name. Um, why is the fact that Adam could name an, uh, um, animals, why does that um, represent the superiority of human intelligence over the, over the intelligence of the angels, which that itself is a statement, is a, is a question, what does that mean? Does it really mean that we are smarter than angels? Um, and I guess in some ways angels are more, have more abstract thinking than we do. So what, it, what, it, what exactly is this Medrash talking about? So of course in the Medrash there's many secrets of Kabbalah alluded to in the Medrash, and this Medrash is no exception. So what does the Medrash, what does the Kabbalah say about a name? It says the Kabbalah that a name is really the tools, the energy through which the source of your spiritual vitality, the source of your spiritual soul um, flows downward to your physical entity. So for example, in modern, in mo in modern terms, um, a name is like the computer code, right? So if you have a writing code, you have to have a certain uh, a formulation which would allow 
that flow of energy to do that idea to flow to your computer or to your laptop. Spiritually, it's the same idea. Every letter represents another um, energy of God. And then you have the order of the letters. The letter that's first is more uh, dominant. And then the combination of letters. And you look at the first book of Kabbalah, the Sefer Yitzira, the book of formation, and you read all about the how every letter represents another energy and the combinations create certain energies. And Kabbalistically speaking, the name is what is the conduit, is the, is, the, is the tool that connects, that allows for the soul to connect to the body. And that's why a name is significant. And that's why if God forbid someone's sick and you have to add a name, what do you mean you have to add a name? So you have to add a name. One interpretation is, one reason why people add, I don't know if you know this, there's a custom that somebody is, one of the ways of, of, of uh, praying and you want to pray for somebody is literally to add a name because so there's a few interpretations why adding a name would help. Number one is if the decree was decreed against the old person, but against the person, then adding a name means I am no longer the person I was before. That's one interpretation. But the more Kabbalistic interpretation is when you add a name, you're literally opening up a new flow of energy to this, to this person. So that's the concept of a name. And again, every creation has um, a name. A name is its soul. And its soul is what allows the energy, the spiritual energy that creates it to flow into this creation. If you read um, Shah Raichu, this the second, the second, the second section of the Tanya, Rabbi Shneer Zalman there explains in the first chapter, he explains that, quotes the Arizal. The Arizal says that every creation has a soul, not just living beings, not just animals, not just vegetation, but even the inanimate has a soul. And he explains, the Arizal explains that the soul is the name of this object in Hebrew is its soul. So a stone is an Eben. So Aleph, Veiz Nun, is the energy that creates the stone. And he elaborates upon that, based on, also based on the principles written in Sefer Yetzirah in the Book of Formation. So that is, um, that is the concept of a name. Now, what does it mean that the angels can't figure out the name of an animal? Now, according to what we, we, we offer, that a name represents the spiritual source and soul of this, of this creature, you would expect, or I would expect, that the angels should actually be more in tune to figure out what the name of the animal is. Why? Because there's so, what, you see a lion. A lion is Arye. What's the name of the lion? It's soul. Where's the soul of the lion? It's spiritual. So I would expect that the angel, who's a spiritual entity, should know this, the name of the soul of the lion more than Adam. Adam is a human creation. So why is it that the angels cannot name the animal? So Hasidic philosophy explains that the problem with the angels is not that they don't see the source of the animal. They know the soul of the animal is Aryeh. The problem is that they don't see how this physical animal in this world could actually be a vessel to its spiritual energy. In other words, from the perspective of the angel, there's spirituality and physicality and there's no connection. And the name represents connection. The name is the conduit. The name is the flow that allows for the spiritual energy to connect to the physical object. So if you're, an, if you're an angel and you say, okay, I have the spiritual energy of the lion. Now I have to find some creature in this world that could be a container for this energy. So the angel says, I don't see anything because I, when I look at the physical world, I see just physical. When I see spiritual, I see just spiritual. The angel cannot connect the name to the creature. Why? Not because the angel... When we say the angel doesn't have intelligence, it means that the angel is missing this capacity to see, to connect sort of the spiritual and the physical. And therefore the angel says, I can't name, I can't name the animal. Because when I see the animal, I don't see anything that can be a vessel to a spiritual concept. Then you say, what's the superiority of the human being? The superiority, what superiority of the human being, and this takes a certain spiritual maturity, is that when the human being sees a physical creature, the human being can figure out and understand that this physical creature is just a vessel to a spiritual energy. In other words, he could see how the physical and the spiritual could connect. And why does the human being have this intelligence? Because in essence, that's what the human being is. We mentioned this many times, that the human being, by definition, is a hybrid between the physical and spiritual. It's embedded in his, it's, 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 he was created dust from the earth, and then God blows within him a spirit, a, a soul, living soul, 
So he has both the physical and the spiritual together. The name of the human being itself, right? Remember, we just talked about a name. Our name defines what the entity is. The name Adam, we said earlier, that Adam, on one hand, Adam means Adam from the word Adama, the word earth. On one hand, the person is very physical. On the other hand, Adame also means I am similar to, and it, and it, and it comes from a verse in Job, Adame Leelion, I'm similar to the one above. So within the name of the human being, the human being represents an entity that is a hybrid of spiritual and physical. And therefore, to express this concept, you say, when Adam looks out at the world and out creations, he doesn't see the physical line. He sees the physical line connected to its spiritual source. And therefore, only Adam is the one who could name. And in that sense, his knowledge, his, his, his uh, perspective is superior to the perspective of of the angels. So that's the concept of, of, of the naming. So we mentioned two interpretations. One interpretation is that Adam names the animals, meaning Adam investigates and sees what's the nature of this animal. And then he gives it a name. And the verse says, whatever Adam named it, that's its name. You need to say what? You need to say that Adam is not gonna develop. Adam is, the animal is not gonna go, is, is not gonna go to therapy. The animal is not gonna experience spiritual growth. Therefore the name doesn't change. But a human being, by contrast, the name will change and the name will develop because a person develops. That's one interpretation. It's more the psychological interpretation. And then the spiritual interpretation is that Adam is able to name the creature because Adam is able to see when Adam sees physical, Adam sees both the physical entity as well as its spiritual source. And that's something unique to Adam because even the spiritual creations, they cannot see the connection between the physical and the spiritual. They certainly could see the soul of the lion but they, don't, they can't figure out how the physical line is connected to its source because the physical is too physical for them to penetrate and see how the physical really is just a vessel and a tool for the spiritual. Okay, that's the story. That, that's, that's just a little bit on name. If anybody wants to make a comment, wonderful. Otherwise, we will continue. A question, Rabbi. Yes. W would it be fair to assume that Adam must have spent at least a limited amount of time studying the characteristics of these animals prior to naming them? Well, that's the question. How did he figure out, how did he figure out the name? So did he observe? Then it would take probably many months and many years to be able to observe and, 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 and figure out the, each ca the character trait of each animal. Maybe he joined National Geographic. Maybe he came out with cameras. That, the problem with that is that would take a long time. So it's possible that either Adam had this innate, 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 um, innate knowledge. In other words, it was gifted to him from God. That's a possibility. If you're a Kabbalist, you would say that Adam, right? There's two ways to figure something out. You can, you can figure, figure it out by observing it in the physical world, or you can figure it out by looking at its spiritual source. So if you're a Kabbalist, you would say, when Adam sees the at lion, and if he could name the lion, which means he could identify the soul of the lion, then the soul of the lion would tell him something about the characteristics of the lion. And therefore, he sees it top down. So the answer to your question is, it depends if you're, if you're, if you're a capitalist. If you're a capitalist, you'd say he looks at the soul. And then if you are more of a practical person, you would say, yes, Adam learns by observation. And I don't know that this verse means it all happened in one, in one day in, that, in one moment. And you read it in, in the order, it sounds like on that day, Adam named all the animals. And it was early in the day, because early in the afternoon, Adam was created Friday afternoon. And uh, there's still a lot that has to unfold Friday afternoon. The whole story of the tree of knowledge happens on Friday afternoon. So if you're reading it on a simple, on, on, on the, on the, on, in the chronological order, you would say Adam named all the animals in just a few hours. That's possible, but it's possible that this means this is the beginning of the process of naming animals, and the process of naming animals continues even later, right? It's possible that he spent his lifetime investigating. So it depends which, which perspective you want to take. You want to take the practical or spiritual. A follow-up question, Rabbi, it's Bob. Yes, yes. Assuming that, that these names required some judgment on the part of Adam, when he when he became a fallen man, did his judgments become null and void? I mean, so the, so I first I, I would I would be tempted to say yes, but the verse says whatever man named him, that is his name, which means the verse endorses Adam's judgments. 
And what exactly does that mean? So there's a lot of, a lot of talk upon this. One, if you want to take this broadly, and I think this is where you're going, you want to take this broadly, what do we know about human observation? In other words, is human observation true? So is it subjective or is it true? In other words, because I observe something, does that mean that is the, that, that, what does the Torah say? When I see something, is that an illusion or is that reality? And I can make, if I'm a, if I can make an argument that everything we process is just a fragment of our ma imagination. And therefore, there's no real way to know that what we're experiencing is true. Because, because who told you that uh, it's Sunday morning and it's 9.30 and you're sitting and studying Torah and there's a pandemic? Maybe it's all in your, in your mind and you'll wake up tomorrow and realize that you're really living in Australia and you're running the marathon. I don't know, right? Who told you? Everything could be, everything could be a fragment of the imagination. So there are Eastern religions that indeed say that the whole world is really, a, uh, it's really an illusion. And what does Judaism say about this? Well, Judaism says it can't be because the premise is that the Torah is true. And if the Torah says that, it's a little circular, but okay. If the Torah says that God created the world, then that's true. So God created the world. So the world is real. Okay, so the world is real. But is my observation real? So some people read this verse, not just about the name of the animals, but to tell you it's broadly about human, about human observation and human, and human impression that man is supposed to look around the world and classify things and say, I think this is this animal, that's, and this animal has this name, this animal has that characteristic. And it's not just the animals, this is just a metaphor for looking around the world and trying to define and understand what we're looking at and, and trying to extrapolate knowledge. And then the Torah says that yes, our subjective impression is indeed true. There is a certain truth to what we see. It may not be the whole truth, but it is certainly true, and that's, what's that, and that's what the end of verse 19 may be saying. Whatever the man called each living creature, that is its name. I Meaning you can say, God is saying, if you want to say broadly, God is saying that our observation has meaning. If, in other words, if God allows our mind, if God gives us the tools to process things in a certain way, it's because God wants us to reach this conclusion, because this conclusion, at least in some, in some measure, is true. So I think that is true even after, even after the fall. Because um, before the fall, it was easier for Adam to, to have clarity. After the fall, the, cl the clarity takes, it takes effort. In other words, if we're, we're picturing here a, a scenario, and we're going to tie this in, once we start talking about the, the tree of knowledge, which we may do today, we start thinking about the world where the physical and the spiritual are really much more in sync. And naming the animals, and at least according to the Kabbalistic interpretation, naming something means you're able to see its soul and its body simultaneously. In other words, you're able to see its soul within the body. And that's, and that, and that's sort of much easier for Adam before the sin. Adam after the sin, after the ingestion of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, then it's much, everything is more blurred. It's harder to see both the physical and the spiritual working, working in harmony. But it's harder, it doesn't mean it's impossible. So it just means it takes more effort. Okay, I hope I hope I at least addressed. I hope at least I'm, I addressed something that that overlaps with what you said. Rabbi. Yes. One question. I I don't. It's more of a um, a conceptual question, and I don't even. It's it's hard to even organize the question. So my so here it goes. So if um if all physical things come from a spiritual place that slowly come down into this world, then this verse seems like Hashem starting with something very physical and then man is backtracking into its spiritual um, source. But isn't it really that Hashem, there's a spiritual source that kind of gets lowered down into yes. a spiritual place? Yes, certainly the way it starts is from above to below. So you have a physical, you have a, you have a spiritual concept that evolves or devolves, depending on your perspective. Let's say from the perspective of the spiritual, it devolves, becomes more and more physical. And then finally, you get something that's so distant, that's con considered spiritual darkness. This world is considered spiritual darkness. Why darkness? You look around, the sun is shining, because you don't see any spirituality. You could look out the world and not see spirituality. And to see spirituality, you have to look. It's not impossible, going back to Bob's point, it's not impossible, but you, but you have to look. It's possible to see no spirituality at all, as do many, many people on this earth. 
So we're, we're in a level of spiritual darkness. So this descends, this devolves from spiritual enlightenment to spiritual darkness. That's the perspective of God. Man, we start from the bottom, right? We look at the physical world. That's our domain. That's our plane. And then we say, could we see this, its source? So we're going bottom up. God is looking top down. That's one interpretation. But another idea is, even from God's perspective, and this relates to what I said before, that the world, the world's, the spiritual worlds devolve and the light diminishes, diminishes, diminishes. But then there's a sort of a big gap between the world just above our world, where the light is very minuscule, very diminished, but there, at least there is light. And then you get to a place of spiritual darkness where there's an absence of light. And that's the physical world. There's Eilam HaAsiyah, the world of action. And then there's the physical world of action. We live in the physical world of action where there's no light at all. So now the question becomes, it's not just that the light has been diminished. It's almost like a break. And the question is, who could see that it's really not a break? Who could see that the physical darkness is really an expression of a spiritual truth? And the angels can't see it because the angels are, can process light. And they could say, this has more light, this has less light, this has less light. But when you get to a place of absolute darkness, they're at a loss. The human being, because the human being is a hybrid, so the human being is, has an element of himself which is physical, which physical means the absence of spiritual light. But the human being is able to understand and say, well, this is not a disconnect. I mean, it appears to be disconnected, but the physical can only come because of the power of the spiritual. So we can elaborate upon this, but I'm just saying it's not just top down. To, uh, uh, there is a real genuine sort of break in the chain of the evolution of the worlds. Okay, what do I mean that, that the world devolves? Just a, just a you know, simple, simple interpretation. Take the concept of, of uh, sweetness, right? So this is all within the physical world. Forget about, forget about the spiritual world. Everything I say now is going to be physical. Even in the physical world, the concept of sweetness has many levels. So for example... One form of sweetness is an idea, a sweet idea. Wow, it's an idea, it's, it's tasty. It really gives you pleasure. Then you can have an idea, a sweetness that devolves, and now it's not as abstract as an idea, it's more tangible and more physical. What's more physical than an idea, but still spiritual? Music, right? Music touches the emotion. Okay, so music could be sweet. And then you know what else could be sweet? Cotton candy is also sweet, right? But you see the break. The first one is completely spiritual. And this one, the physical taste, it's a physical substance. It, 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 it triggers a physical response. Now, they all stem from the same spiritual abstract idea. They're all, there's all sweetness. But one is more spiritual than the other. And it evolves. But the bottom one, the lowest one, the physical one, is sort of separated from the other ones. And all these examples are, are considered physical. From the spiritual perspective, Sweetness is the sweetness of the knowledge of God. And that's what an angels understand. And the angels, you say, you say, okay, connecting to God is sweet and cotton candy is sweet. The angels, they don't understand how this is, one flows from the other. One is physical, one is spiritual, they're disconnected. They don't see the connection. But the human being is a hybrid. A human being could say, ultimately, the sweetness of the physical creation devolves from and then stems from the spiritual sweetness. And therefore, it's our job to reconnect it because that's its source. How do you reconnect the sweetness of a physical thing to a spiritual source? Well, you use it for a spiritual purpose. So if you're going to eat good food on Shabbos, that's a mitzvah. If you're going to drink something, drink a coffee, and that will help you study Torah, you're reconnecting the physical pleasure to a spiritual source. That is the function of a human being. That's something the angels cannot do. So when God brings the animals to Adam and says, could you name them? It's really like saying, this is your mission. Could you really reconnect the physical to its spiritual source? And therefore, if that's the reading, then I don't think it happened only once on that Friday afternoon. But I think that in some sense, that's really the mission of humanity all along. Everything we do is we're naming the creation. We're connecting to it. We're connecting it to its spiritual source. And then it's both pre, pre, the, pre the, the tree of knowledge of sin and post the sin. After the fall, we also have to do it. Back to Bob's point. It's harder. It's more difficult. It's more complicated. Because, because the, the, phys, the, the good and the bad are sort of out of sync. Physical and spiritual are sort of more, more, more at war. But we'll get to that. But this is, now this becomes a big idea. Could you name something? means could you put it in its proper place in, in, in its function, in the purpose of creation? Could you put it in context? That's really what name is, naming something is. And putting the physical object, the physical entity in this world in context means 
connecting it to its spiritual source and using it to fulfill its spiritual source. That's what a name, a name is placing it. Shame is sham, put it where it belongs, put it in the proper context. Rabbi? Yes. A question about naming, um, when I was listening to this whole conversation and especially the first interpretation that you have, um, that uh, naming is like reverse engineering. For example, uh, God said first and then physical world created. Here, right. human being is looking at the physical creation and reverse engineering into the word. So is that the origin of prophecy, poetry, everything that we kind of reverse engineering, putting that uh, spiritual essence trying trying to put the spiritual essence into words i think so i think so the talmud says that when when a, when a medrash says that when i believe it's the medrash that when parents name a child they have a ruach hakodesh ruach hakodesh is a literally it's a form of prophecy it's the it's the it's the ruach it's the, the holy spirit in other words when you decide what you're going to name your child even if you decided uh, many months in advance many years in advance it's a divine inspiration. And that's a form of prophecy. Because again, naming a child is finding the letters that will serve. The Hebrew name are the letters that serve the, the, the soul. This is what you connects know, the soul to the body. Going, so I can bless you. Do you need ca cashola? Yeah, oh, so that is something that is, and that is something so that is a form of prophecy. Ask my wallet or I'll look for it. Uh, anyway. So that is something that I know when I had a, I had a child, so, uh, um, when one of my children were born, we still had, uh, we had, what is it, Kanai Nahara, we had four great-grandparents, four great-grandmothers alive. So um, that was a problem. What, we, what are we going to name, what, what, what are we going to name uh, our daughter? We didn't know it's going to be a girl, but you think you have nine months to prepare to figure out 50% chance it's going to be a boy, 50% chance it's going to be a girl. We had no idea. Uh, uh, we, we had no idea what would we do if we named it, if it was a girl turned out to be a girl. And the problem with us is we have a custom that we name immediately, the first time when you read the Torah. So I forget, it, it may have been that morning or the next morning, and we had no name. And it was, I would say, it was, uh, we really needed, the, the, we desperately needed the divine help. And it turned out that we got the divine help because it was the name we named that we named our daughter Cherub after her great grandmother. And honestly, I wasn't in love with the name, I'll be honest right now. But it's some, and it so happened to be that after I heard the name, we learned that the day she was born was her yard site, her great-grandmother's yard site. And somehow the second I heard that, they said, okay, this is the name. It just, it just, all of a sudden, I like the name. And that's a form of divine prophecy. So in other words, it's a divine spirit. In other words, when you decide what you're naming your child, the Medro says, that's Ruach HaKadosh. That's a divine, that, that, that's, a spirit, that's a spirit of prophecy. Again, you, like Vicky says, you reverse engineering. You have to now figure out what's the origin, what's the source of this, of this, of this soul. So it's mystical, but that's what a name is. But we're figuratively naming things every day of the year. When you buy something, when you take something into your life, and you say, "I'm putting this into context. How am I going to use it? How is it going to serve me? What purpose am I using it for?" That's naming, because in Hebrew, the word shame is the word sh is the word sham. You're placing it in its proper context. That's what naming means. Okay, you have to have a name to remind you what the context is, but, that, but, but that's a secondary function. The real function of a name is to define it, give it its context, and use it in the proper context. And that is, uh, why, that, and that's why this verse is so important because man naming animals, so man is really a metaphor for man naming all, of crea all creations. And naming means being able to see the connection between the physical and the spiritual. Okay, fine, that's with the name. Now, the problem with man naming all the animals, so now at man, like Steve says, man has to investigate the characteristics of the animals. Either or you take the Kabbalistic interpretation or the spiritual interpretation, but he does so spiritually. He sees the name, he sees the soul, so he knows the characteristics. Or by observation. Either way, it's a very interesting verse. This is, the, this is um, um, chapter 2, verse 20. Very interesting verse. The man gave names to every animal, to the birds of the heaven, and to every beast of the field. But the man did not find a helper for himself. So he can't, he doesn't have a partner. He names everybody, but he has no partner for himself. What's the connection? 
The first half of the verse is discussing finishing the naming of the animals. The second interpretation, the second half of the verse is discussing his, uh, his, 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 dating, his dating prospects. What does one have to do with the other? Well, because names means could you define the creations around you. So when Adam looks around and he sees the animals and he sees that they may be impressive, but they, 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 they are different than the human being. And that emphasizes to him that he doesn't have a Ezer Kenegdoi, to hear they translate helper for himself. But like we said last week, Ezer is a help opposite him. And we discussed that at great length. Help opposite means somebody that helps you by being different than you. In other words, by complimenting you, by sometimes even opposing you is actually how they help you. But somebody that you can relate to, not from a position of power, which is the way um, the, uh, the human relates to the animal. We said vayitzer, Rashi quotes as I mentioned before. Vayitzer could mean the form, but in this context, um, Rashi says that, the med, Rashi quotes the Medrash, that Yitzira here means to rule. Like I said before, when you besiege a city, so Adam's relationship with the animals, they certainly can help him, right? A animals, at least the domesticated animals, help the human being every day. But they're not opposite. Opposite in the context of cross. We discussed this last week. They're not on the same level. It's not somebody you can have a conversation with face-to-face -face on your level and the level of your abstract intelligence. Um, it's more of a position of, 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 of uh, hierarchy where you're superior to the animal. And therefore, by naming the animals, that's where Adam feels the void, feels what he is missing. And then we read verse 21. Verse 21, because Adam is missing now, Adam is now God um, creates Eve. And this verse is, of, of course, always read wrong and translated wrong. So we have to just straighten that out. Um, Oy vey, what kind of book do I have? Oh my God, I can't even believe this. Okay, 21. Hashem Elohim caused unconsciousness to fall upon the man. Literally, Tardema. I don't know what I have. I happen to have an uncommon translation. Tardema means a deep sleep. Hashem Elohim places a deep sleep upon Adam, and he slept. He took one of his ribs and closed over, over flesh in its place. Uh, if you're holding an English chumash on verse 21, does it translate it differently? My verse says, Hashem Elohim caused unconsciousness or a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. He took one of his ribs and closed over flesh in its place. So if you're reading another version of the Chumash, do you have any other translation? So you may know this, but this is, a, um, this is an interesting, a big idea. In other words, a big mistake. Um, Rashi says that the word Selah, the word rib, is not rib. The word Selah means side side of the human being. Um, and Rashi quotes a verse, the side of the tabernacle, the tzela hamishkan. And Rashi says, this is proof to what Rashi said earlier, that when Adam and Eve were created, they were created together back to back, and then they were separated. So when it says that man, God took one of his ribs, it doesn't mean he took a rib, he took a small portion of man, and then woman was built from that rib. Uh, it means he literally took, took, took a side of the human being. In other words, just separated the two, the way Rashi said earlier. And Rashi says the word sela means a side. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean a rib. And I read elsewhere, I don't know, I mean, I can't. I read elsewhere that in modern Hebrew, a tsela is a rib. But I read elsewhere that nowhere in the five books of Moses, actually nowhere in the Bible, does the word sela mean rib. It doesn't mean rib. Um, maybe in the later Hebrew it means rib, but not in the Bible. So it's not like there are two interpretations for rib and people, and, and it became popular to think about the wrong translation. In the Bible, there is only one translation of the word selah, and it's not rib, it's side. So this is very important because um, the people who feel that the Torah is in fact um, endorsing the concept that men and women are not equal because look, man is uh, created by God, and then woman is only created by a rib of man, and this is sort of emphasizing that they're not equal, they are completely out of touch with their simple Hebrew, the biblical Hebrew, that Selah, both Adam and Eve were created by God back to back, and now it's separation. It's not rib, it's side. So that's very important to, to emphasize. Um,
that's important. That's important to emphasize. Okay, what do we know? We know that that there will has the God had to put that put Adam to sleep. Okay, it makes sense. If you're going to do a surgery, you need anesthesia. I know there was no anesthesia back then, but that's what you need. You need Adam and Eve to fall asleep. The question is, is there a deeper meaning here? In other words, is there a spiritual and psychological interpretation as well to this deep sleep? Hashem Elohim caused unconsciousness or tardema. Tardema is a deep sleep. Hashem causes Adam, Adam, and Adam to have a sort of a deep sleep, and then he sees he see, and then and then only then can Eve be created. And then read verse 22. Hashem Elohim built. Here they read the, the rib, but it's the side that he took from man into a woman, and he brought her to man. Man said, this at last is a bone of my bones, a flesh of my flesh. This shall be called woman, for from man she was taken. Um, so what's happening here? Is there, is, is, what, what exactly does this mean? So there are various interpretations. One modern interpretation, which is a little bit cute, I don't know if it's supposed to be funny or cute or real, but there's certainly truth to it. And that is an interesting concept. And the concept is that because man, Adam, man and woman are different, and certainly once they're separated, they're very different, the only way man and woman can come together is when they are asleep. What does it mean when they're asleep? Sleep means when they are not in their full intelligence. In other words, when they turn off their ability to uh, question. In other words, in simple English, it means they have to fall in love. When man and woman fall in love, what happens when a person falls in love? When a person falls in love, the person is no longer thinking objectively. So in some sense, the person is blinded by the love. So the fact of the matter is that if people wouldn't fall in love, maybe they wouldn't, they wouldn't get together because I would always see the faults of the other person and the faults of the other person would always inter interfere. So what does God do? Just like he did to Adam, he plays a trick. What's the trick? The trick is you fall asleep. What does it mean you fall asleep? It means you fall in love. What happens when you fall in love? When you fall in love means that you're not thinking objectively. And therefore, like the verse says, um, upon that, 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 love, that love covers and conceals all, all, all sin. In other words, if I'm in love, I don't see the negative aspect of the other person. And in some sense, and then what happens? What happens when you wake up? So when you wake up and the honeymoon is over, the love, you're no longer in, in, in the blinding love. Okay, but once you are ready together, now you have a model. Now you understand that you could work to recreate that feeling where because of the love, the fault of the other person is no longer, no, no longer bothers you, just like your own fault doesn't bother myself. But just like my fault doesn't bother me, so my spouse's fault is just like my own fault. But a per person wouldn't get to that without, without first experiencing the blinding, the blinding form of love and some people would say that is what the verse is telling here. To bring Eve and Adam together, there has to be a deep sleep. And deep sleep it doesn't only mean um, for the creation, but deep sleep means to bring them together. And that is what, that's the blessing that God, that, that God um, gives us in order to show us that we could become one in the sense that I don't recognize the faults of the other, just like I don't recognize the faults of myself. You could experience that. In can, and it's likely that that feeling will then you'll wake up, but then you understand that you can recreate that through your own effort, through your own intelligence. So that is one way of thinking about the concept of this verse of the falling asleep. One more point to read is to read verse 23. I'm not sure what 23 is saying. It could be good, it could be bad. The man said, this at last is bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. This shall be called woman, for from man she was taken. So the word isha, the word woman, is the same word as the word ish, man. But remember that we know that, that Adam, God called them, in chapter one it says God created man, but there it uses the word Adam. Adam is the name God gives. And here, all of a sudden, the Torah uses the word ish. Man says, we're gonna call her isha, a woman, the feminine form of ish, because she was taken from the ish. So is, is he, is, is, is 
Adam and Ish, or is he an Adam? So again, that just shows that man doesn't have one name. And that in the scripture has four names representing different aspects of the human being. But one interpretation is that Adam, the way God names Adam is when Adam and Eve are complete. When they're complete, they're Adam. What does complete mean? When they were created as one. When they're separated, then they're Ish and Isha, because they're incomplete. And then when they reconnect, then they're once again Adam. So Adam represents the name of completeness. And Ish and Isha represent the fact that they're now incomplete because of the separation. And this is not perfect because later God refers to Adam, but there he says Ha-Adam. Ha-Adam may be different than Adam. Okay, so we'll get to that as we, as we continue. Rabbi, can I ask you a question? Yes. About the names Isha and Isha. Uh, yes. When Hashem took the side and filled it and filled the flesh in its place. The side, there was, the, the human being was created as one, so there was a female side. Can we assume that it's a female side that was separated and spiritually they are one? But then yeah. Isha, Isha, it's because the, Adam gave the name Isha, the same he gave name to the animals. So it's more like a physical, his ability to name the physical reality. Yeah. Comes so let's take, let's take two things. Let's take, two, let's take this apart. Yes, according to the tradition we mentioned before, Rashi quotes it, they're created back to back, then they're separated. So when it says the side, God fills in the side, that's probably the back, because they were back to back. According to the Medrash, Rashi quotes it. Again, this is not New Age. This is written down at least 1,800 years ago. So that's for that. Uh, regarding naming Isha, is this a good name? Is this the right name? Does is this, is this represent Adam's deep understanding, or is this verse represent Adam, Adam missing the point? So w when you read the verse simply, it sounds like, okay, he's saying he's naming her. She's naming her. She's saying she's Isha because she's taken from Ish. But the commentary, some of the modern commentaries point out and say, this is a problem. This verse is, a, in fact, this, this, this verse is a problem because, in other words, not the verse. What Adam does here is a problem because, again, his job is to define all the creations, and indeed, all creations were created to serve the human being and help the human being serve God. When Adam names the woman, what does he name her? He names her as an extension of self. He says, this one will be called the Isha because she's taken from an Ish. So if you ask an Adam, what is the definition of a woman? What is he going to say? Taken from man. Taken from man may be a problem because that's not the definition of woman. In fact, after the sin of the tree of knowledge, right after Adam and Eve were punished and expelled from the garden, you would think, um, you would think, let me find the verse, no, a little before, before they were expelled, but after they were punished, and after God said that he's going to be, that, 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 that after God punishes them, it's a fascinating verse. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. What does the verse say in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20? After the sin, after God says you're going to die, and you're going to have to work hard to get your bread, and, the, and, and all the curse, all the, all the punishments. What happens after that? What's the first thing? What's man's response? Probably scream at his wife and say, you got me into this trouble. No. What's man's response? Man said, you said, renames Eve. The man called his wife's name Chava, Eve because she had become the mother of all living. Okay, now we're talking, right? Up till now, he says, you are Isha. Why are you an Isha? Because you're an extension of, of me. Okay, that's what happens when you, fall, when you first fall in love. Why do you fall in love? Why do you love the other person? Because of what the other person does for you, right? That's not a healthy uh, attitude. That ultimately is gonna lead to the sin that ultimately is going to lead to Adam and Eve's inability to communicate and understand each other, and ultimately that will lead to the sin. Because if you read the entire story, Adam does not speak to Eve until after the story of the Tree of Knowledge. Why should they speak to each other? Adam's perspective is that the woman is not on his level. The woman is an extension of himself. The woman is here to serve him. That's why he called her Isha. That's what did not allow them to talk and to communicate and to understand each other 
And that's what allows for the sin as we will, as we will discuss. What happens after the sin? What's the first step of the rehabilitation? The first step of the rehabilitation is to realize the other person is not an extension of self. The woman is not an extension of self. The woman has her own identity. What is her identity? She's the mother of every living being. Now, I'm not sure that's the perfect identity because a woman is more than being the, woman, the, the mother of every living being. But at least it gives her her own identity in Adam's mind, not an extension of himself. Then you think about when's the next time a, woman, a, 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 woman, a woman's name was changed? That was Sarah, right? And the, the, the God tells Sarah to change his wife's name from Sarai, my minister, to Sarah, to the minister of everybody. Minister of everybody is actually even a higher level than the mother of every living being because the mother of every living being seems like you're serving it. And if you're the minister, then they serve you. But what you see here, the pattern, the pattern is that in the beginning of the relationship, Adam, it takes time to develop into the relationship of realizing that the other person is actually not an extension of yourself. And it takes time for Adam, and it really takes time for every person, because every person in the beginning is the immature relationship. And the immature relationship is when people fall in love, it's like amazing because the other person is an extension of me. When we fall out of love and I start seeing the other person, how the other person is different than me and the other person challenges me, that's not a problem. That's all of a sudden, you now you name her, now you say she has her own identity. Now she's Ein Kol Chai, she's the mother of every living being, or she's the, it's the minister of everybody, depending how you understand it. But the idea here is, this is a process of understanding how the process of from becoming one to two to one again is not so simple. It's complex. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. And then we read the verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and cling or cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. What's therefore? Therefore is because of what we said earlier that they were created as one. In other words, because they were created as one, so both physically and spiritually, they were one entity. Therefore, even once they separate, they both desire to reconnect and become one again. So the separation wasn't for the purpose of separation. The separation was for the purpose that when they reunite, it's actually gonna be a more mature um, connection, not as back to back, where you're an extension of myself, but as you're across me, you're opposite than me, you're different than me, and because of your differences, you actually could, comp you could, you could, you could help me by your differences because you complement me. You bring to the table that which I don't have, and I learn to extend beyond myself and relate to someone who's different than me. And when you do that, that's when you fully become one person. So that's the process from one to two to one. We wouldn't have that if we weren't created as one. If we weren't one in the beginning, and we wouldn't have that if had we not separated. If you were two separate entities coming together, you would never achieve that oneness because ultimately two entities cannot become one. But if we're always one, then we can't see the other as, as, as we can't have that respect. So in other words, the fact that we're one creates the love. The fact that they were separate creates the respect and both are necessary for, for, for the relationship between man and woman. And again, the relationship between man and woman is ultimately a metaphor for the relationship with a reflection and a metaphor for the relationship between man and God. Our soul and God is also, we were one, we separate, we come into this world, we become a person, but ultimately the purpose of the separation is the reunion, and that's what, why we say that the giving of the Torah was like the marriage. The Medgar says, for the Mishnah, that the wedding day of God is the first day the Torah was given. What, what's the Torah? The Torah is once again taking us and God, the world and God. In our source, we were one, we separate, we reunite. That's the model of the Torah's idea of unity and of becoming and of becoming one. So this is the story in short. Probably next week we start discussing the concept and the story of the tree of knowledge and good health. Uh, I wish everybody a good week and uh, be well. If anybody wants to make a comment or a question or a joke, please go ahead. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Steve.